gonna talk a little bit about GraphQL and our implementation absinthe. Um, I hope you can take a look at our website, which we've got linked down there on the left, which has some guides and other information. Uh, and our community page is how you can reach us. We've been using GraphQL um, and absinthe in production for about nine months now. It's been a really good experience for us, um, both as back-end developers, mobile developers, and front-end developers, and so we've been really happy that CargoSense has been willing to um, encourage and support this. Before we jump fully into, uh, into GraphQL, however, um, I want to talk a little bit about why the thing that drew, one of the things that drew me to Elixir was how I felt like when I sat down to solve a problem, the code I was writing was about that problem. Which is to say, the, there were abstractions the language and platform was giving me that could let me focus on doing whatever it was I had uh, I needed to do to solve the problem, and it wasn't cluttered with mechanics of dealing with um, you know, some of the underlying, underlying mechanisms. And what struck me then and continues to strike me today was how well those abstractions fit together. And as I wrote more Elixir code and better understood how it and the features we get from Erlang work, um, I realized that the reason they can do that is because they're all built from these uh, really composable underlying building blocks that we get from the beam. Um, so instead of giving us like supervision trees or instead of giving us pooling as like a, a feature, it gives us the tools that let us build those things and extend them. And I think that's part of why it's been such a, such a successful system over the decades uh, that, that people have been using it. Um, and I think that's just like a one characteristic of, uh, of good systems in general is that they give us the tools to build tools and they give us features out of which fall more features. So, and I'm gonna argue that I think GraphQL is one of those things, but it's probably best to do that in light of where we are. So let's look at REST, um, and let's look at uh, one particular thing about REST, which is how REST models relationships and hierarchies. These things are sort of basic to data, uh, whether it's like users that have, um, you know, friends, or it's uh, uh, even just in a user, how it's the, the name, a property of a user relates to, relates to the name we have. So on the request side, you've got basically like a linear path, and that's all right. On the response side, there tends to be one of two camps that happens. You've got the, um, the sort of link to things camp, where data that is immediately associated with the, uh, the resource in question is presented to you, but if you want information about an associated resource, you have to go ask that thing. Um, this is one of only, uh, uh, only one of many ways that, that these links end up being used. But the general idea is that if you want to know something about a resource, generally speaking, you're going to have to go follow the link to it. This kills the mobile. Um, <laughs> requests on mobile are expensive. They're expensive in terms of time because the, the latency characteristics of mobile networks are uh, expensive in terms of power consumption because if you're having to do a bunch of requests, the radios have got to be on the whole time. They've got to be operating in ways that they don't need to be if you're not needing to request more data. So what this tends to lead to is the other camp of REST, where when we want associations, we serialize all the things. Um, and that's what we get. We tend to get this in the browser, too, because honestly, browsers aren't super good at making lots of concurrent requests either. There's a lot of limitations about how many they'll do to a given domain and stuff. So the problem here is that we no longer have an API of resources, but an API of bespoke data views for each and every use case. And so this lead on the back end leads to a wild proliferation of code because you've got basically generally custom code for each and individual use case. Um, and there's also this implicit uh, uh, client-server contract that's formed. Because even if you're following less best practices, and this is the mobile thing, so you got slash, mobile, v1, users, the, that just tells you that what you were getting from that API last week, if they're following the right rules, you should still be getting that today. It doesn't actually tell you what data you need from that API. It doesn't tell you what data your client expects from that API, just that it hasn't changed. We can do better than that. And so um, we're gonna look at some of the tools that GraphQL gives us to answer these kinds of questions. And we're also gonna look at how those tools come together to produce 
um, some ridiculously awesome features. And then we're also going to look at uh, how our implementation, Absinthe, brings those to you uh, and what it means for uh, Elixir developers and users of um, Elixir libraries. So, um, as we saw, relationships and hierarchies are um, one, of the, one of the main things we're trying to, trying to solve. So, this is a GraphQL query. Um, and you'll notice that we're, getting, we're gonna be declaring exactly what we want out of the response. And this is our response. There is this exact correspondence between what we ask for and what we get. Nothing less and also nothing more. This is really great for mobile in that you can ask for a lot of data and you'll get back in one request exactly what you want. But you also won't get back, often asking for lots of data can be, you're gonna get stuff you don't actually need and this wastes bandwidth, it wastes, um, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. So the, the structure of the query itself tells us a lot about, um, about the client server contract and we've been able to make it explicit. We actually know even more because of another characteristic of GraphQL where all the data going in and out has an associated type. Um, and this type system, in addition to holding some invariance about this stuff that is, is actually really nice, is also a, a gonna be a powerful enabler of um, a bunch of features we'll see later on. So back to REST real quick. REST is uh, basically untyped. So we have a REST endpoint and we're gonna get events and we wanna get it on a particular day and maybe at a particular location. Considerations, which of these are actually valid? Um, is, is the date a valid shaped date? With that location ID, you know, uh, often your query param parser is smart enough to turn like a number into, uh, um, like the text four into the integer four, or sometimes your database wrapper will, will be okay with that too. But suppose the client makes a mistake. They pass the name in, for example, of the location they're looking for, not the ID. Ecto will blow up, which is probably the right answer because you, it, you're not gonna just, uh, you, you can't turn like Disney World, that's not an ID, that doesn't make any sense. Active record will make it zero and carry on. Neither of these are what you want. From a client perspective, what you would like is something that says, hey, don't do that, that was wrong, do this thing instead. Um, so just to, to sketch you know, code you would need to, to do this stuff, you've got your like, whitelist of things, you're gonna go through the parameters and pull out each of the values, and then for each of those things, you might need to do some custom handling on one of them to make it a date or whatever. And look, I'm, my head's not been in the sand, I know there are tools to deal with this. People are using ecto change sets, they're using um, there's like the JSON API thing, um, Bruce Williams and I wrote VEX almost three years ago, I think this Saturday, to do exactly this thing. Data validation tools exist, and I do not have time to do a one, uh, like a one-on-one -on -one comparison of them in this talk. What I think you're gonna see though is that the kinds of invariants that GraphQL is gonna let you articulate and that it will hold for you about your data are kind of stand in a class on its own. I do hope to have a blog post out about that soon, kind of going into it in more depth. So this is, this is the controller callback, basically, uh, that, that you get by hitting this API endpoint. If you notice, the irrelevant part of the code is in the bottom little right-hand corner where we finally call event.list on our filters. That's the important part here. And if you write in GraphQL, this is what you get to actually do. So up top you have the equivalent, um, uh, uh, the GraphQL query that would be analogous to our, our REST query. We're passing in a location and we're, we're trying to get it on a particular date. But our code, because GraphQL has held some invariance for us, we can just filter on those things. Now, how is this enough? It's enough because what we end up doing is we have a schema. So this is the full story. And so to remind you of our geography, up top we've got our, uh, our GraphQL query, that middle is just exactly the same function we had before. And then this bottom part is Elixir code written with the Absinthe library, where we have a correspondence between, we have field events, and that is what gets, um, well that's what describes the query we have up top. And then we have the arguments that constitute valid parameters to that field, our date, our location, our name. We also have a return type specified for that field. That's the list of event thing. Um, we'll get to that more in a second. So 
what this has done is it actually inverts the control flow that you often see in a controller. The controller hands you invalid parameters, or certainly parameters about which you don't know very much, and you have to hand it off very often, some kind of tool or library that will validate it, return information, and then you can kind of carry on. GraphQL is the other way around, where you articulate the invariance that you're gonna ha hold on uh, a field, and then if and only if those things actually obtain, will it call your code, and you don't have to worry about it. So we're gonna look at um, a couple of these types really quick to see how that happens. Um, our date type, our string type, and uh, the event type. So, because uh, it's worth pointing out, when we, if we were to look at our date type from um, the filters there, from our def events, it's actually a full-blown calendar struct at this point. Like, you don't have to worry about the fact that it's sort of represented up as a string up here at the top. This works because we have a date scaler. Scalers are just value types. They're things like strings, numbers, dates, et cetera. And they all have a parse and a serialize function. Parse's job is to take it from the external representation, like a string, and to make sure that there, it is a valid internal representation for that thing. So if, it, if that function returns okay in a date time struct, you're great, your function's gonna get a date time struct. If it doesn't, it'll generate um, some relatively impressive error handling we'll see later that'll get returned to the client. Um, the, uh, and then the serialize is for going the other way. So if you return something that has a date in it, that handles uh, uh, putting it back into the external representation. Here's a string. So there's no special casing here. Like our implementation ships with strings, integers, uh, other things, floats, because everyone uses them. But all of the tools we use to build types are exactly the tools that you have when you use Absinthe, and this gives you basically all of, all of that power to use uh, for your own domain. Um, lastly, this is our event type. You'll notice, by the way, throughout, we've actually been able to stick documentation on this stuff, and you'll see where that comes in here in a minute. Um, and on the date field, location field, and, and name field, not only do they have a type, they have a thing that we're, we have a non-null around that type. So we're declaring things that must hold not only about data that comes in, but data that goes out. And this turns out to be not only super useful for those of us who are back-end developers to catch mistakes, problems, or just make sure we don't have to worry about certain things, it also turns out to be wildly helpful for clients, because clients can figure out stuff about our schema as well. So this is another GraphQL query that we can make and it asks the schema to tell us about itself. So this will return just some basic type information, because it's a, this is not special cased either. We ship with these introspection types because everyone should use them, but if we didn't, you could make these types that return information about your schema. Uh, this is what I meant by like GraphQL giving us features that fall, out of which fall further features. So what falls out of this, is probably the coolest, um, uh, the coolest um, API exploration tool ever in that we have uh, this thing. So this is, if I can figure out where my mouse is, there it is. Um, this is a little piece of JavaScript that we, when you run it, it hits the server with this, oopsies, uh, that's gonna be hard to see. Slightly more complicated, you don't have to worry about the details of it, but it's this same, underscore schema thing we were doing before. It's just a bigger query so we can get more information. And what we get with that is uh, an overly zoomed in web browser, there we go. So we get, amongst other things, documentation. So this is a, a relatively silly little example um, a, that represents the Star Wars universe. You tend to see it around the, the GraphQL community. And so we can just go splunking, basically, like, hey, there's this empire field. It returns a faction. What if factions, hey, look, if you get it, factions will always have an ID. This, this exclamation point here means it's non-null. These are things that clients can just know in an automatic way about your schema. More than just self-documentation though, this tool actually lets you construct GraphQL queries. So you can start typing and hey, it auto-fills it in for you. This, keep in mind, this piece of JavaScript knew literally nothing about our schema until it started running and ran the introspection query. Um, you can get things like the ID and the name. And if we make mistakes, like ask it for a field that doesn't exist, when we run this, we're gonna get back uh, two things that I think are very important to note. 
One is this error message that talks about, hey, this is valid, and the line information, which is super nice. We hope to bring you col column information soon. Um, Lex and uh, Yek don't have column information, so we don't have that yet. Um, but we also actually get still the name and ID. So the GraphQL spec not only spends a lot of time talking about what constitutes an error, but how the um, server should behave when it runs into an error. And the answer generally is like, if there were children off of this, like this, these will not show up because its parent is bad, therefore it doesn't make any sense to talk about the children. But siblings are still good, it will still try to get you that error. Um, and this helps provide kind of consistency across the, the experience of, of using GraphQL servers. So anyway, introspection, it's cool. It, the introspection gives you um, actually a lot more than just, uh, than just like query exploration. So here we've got like a, a basic response. Um, and you'll notice there's two things that return something that's basically an organization. Our user has a primary organization and our location as an organization. Just looking at the JSON blob, we can't really know for sure that these are actually the same thing. But if we can introspect on the type, and there's certain invariants held about how you return IDs for things of the same type, there's ridiculously cool caching libraries that are being built that operate on GraphQL servers because they can use this type information to do really, really intelligent and granular caching about values. I do not know how they work and we will not be going into that, but it's the kind of thing that can happen in a generic way because of how much clients can figure out about uh, the server with which they're interacting. So, um, we also have um, some really, really neat uh, features that are developing on the query side of the equation as well. And this is kind of making, so we're getting into kind of experimental territory, both as far as absence, absinthe specifically um, and the GraphQL community in general. So in this query, you'll notice that we have um, on the, our response, we have our feed and our stories and the author and message for each of the stories, but the comments don't seem to be there. And that's because the comments had what's called a directive applied to it, the defer directive. And suppose you have um, a client interface of some kind where the story that front of feed is immediately apparent to you, but some additional thing has to be done, whether it's just scrolling or maybe cl clicking on a little like show thing to actually see the comments. We can make the response uh, we can make this interface extra responsive by saying, hey, I want to get the story message and author immediately. And then like, hey, in a subsequent part of maybe it's a chunked HTTP response, maybe it's a WebSocket client, send us the comments like as you get those uh, or, or send them in a second chunk. And so you can, so this is particularly crucial on mobile where big payloads and comments often can be a much bigger payload than the original story. Um, payload size affects the transmission, uh, the time it takes to get that data to your server a lot. So by having the core content the user is going to see happen as quickly as possible, we can optimize that experience. Um, deferral is really just kind of the beginning of what we're seeing there. Um, suppose instead the experience is kind of like on a mobile thing where there's like a, a list of stories and so you want like the most recent story, you're only gonna see one and then you'll like scroll and see the other ones. So maybe we wanna stream the stories and we're still deferring the comments. These things compose and, and all that. So this will actually, as you get a story, boom, it'll like send that particular story to you until it's sent all of them. Or maybe you're on WebSockets and we're doing it live where as stories are happening or as comments are happening, we're gonna be just pushing this data to you over WebSockets, over some kind of chunked HTTP response um, all of this is um, all this is still developing, but it's the kind of features that I'm confident we're going to be able to see on the basis of the tooling we've been given. Um, and, and lastly, it's also worth emphasizing how much control the client can exhibit over the how what data they get and how they get that data. Like this is all the server does not know anything about the client other than this document, and this is the kind of stuff we're trying to do. So um, Absent is a GraphQL server implementation for Elixir, and it's what brings all of this, it lets your Elixir uh, servers speak this spec. And so when we set out to build Elixir, we had, or sorry, Absent, we had a bunch of goals. I'm gonna chat briefly a little bit about where we are with some of those and uh, where we're working too.
So um, this is like another little example of uh, some, some code you'd write with absent. And as you notice, uh, we've misspelled our user thing. So schemas are compiled, and this actually gives a number of, a number of features. Uh, they compile basically into functions on the schema module. This lets us do things like really nice error handling. So we can tell you not only that user's not a real type and you misspelled it, but also the line number and sort of why it is that we're, why it is that we're telling you this. This is one of several checks we do at compile time to help both enforce correctness and it just makes for a nicer development experience when you can get sort of problems as, as early as possible. Um, but this, um, this schema compilation also helps us um, do certain kinds of attach metadata to parts of the schema that um, let us speed up certain things. So uh, this is not actually a, an example here, but a lot of um, a lot of your GraphQL clients are going to be JavaScript, and in JavaScript you tend to have field names that are camel case. That's not particularly natural in Elixir. We tend to go with snake case. We can at compile time know that like you can specify, hey, we're going to be interacting with clients that are using camel case fields. And so we'll annotate each of the fields with the camelized version. So then when we're run doing it runtime, we don't have to run macro.camelize on the fields or anything. We don't have to do any runtime transformations to grab particular fields. We can try to do as much as we can at compile time, because GraphQL is a complicated system. We don't want to introduce any overhead into uh, your, your wildly fast uh, Phoenix performance experience. It can also help us, um, this is a, a uh, chunk of schema that's using some uh, pagination uh, uh, conventions that have developed um, around one of the, the Facebook built uh, GraphQL client. There's some sort of mechanical translations that have to happen to build some helper, helper stuff for that pagination. And we can also do, again, all that at compile time when you don't have to write a bunch of really verbose boilerplate stuff. You also don't have to pay uh, a performance penalty. So these are just some of the like, basic developer-oriented stuff that we've been trying to do uh, so far. And, um, and so what we have coming up real quickly, uh, this is, we're hoping to get this out in like the next couple days as a release candidate. Um, so how do you go from <laughs> a GraphQL document to the response? Like what goes on there? Turns out a whole lot more than we thought when we started. The GraphQL JS implementation has something around 30,000 lines of JavaScript code. And that's like ES6 and ES7 where we're doing all this stuff to like minimize boilerplate and stuff. It is nuts. And so when Bruce and I set out to build this originally, we just built something that worked. And that was in and of itself uh, quite the effort. But what, um, what's kind of happened there is that the code that came out of that is a little bit difficult to follow, and it's definitely not extensible. So what we're trying, what we're coming out with is basically an approach to executing that breaks uh, the problem into lots of little phases. So you'll notice both of these things are basically trees. And so we represent the, um, the schema, or sorry, the query that comes in as a tree of values, and then we just walk that through a number of functions that just transform and tag that tree with stuff like, hey, this should be null, or this shouldn't be null, but it is. And then later on, we can kind of grab that value off and return it to users. This is because we're really trying to sort of bring this to the community at large, and an important part of that is making sure that our code is understandable so that people can actually contribute to it, understand it, if they find bugs, figure out why, that kind of thing. Um, so things that we're, we're really kind of aiming for in the future. Um, we already do compilation on uh, the schema, like I talked about, um, but what we, uh, what we would like to also do is actually compile a lot of uh, the queries themselves. So if you have something that's particularly performance critical, you have to remember, this is a Facebook technology, they know a lot about uh, having serious perform uh, performance pressure, and so we're trying to with, because we have this, uh, the execution model broken into many steps, we'd like to be able to execute some of those steps on chunks of a document, and then basically like either bake into a module or store an ETS or something, um, all of that work done kind of ahead of time, so that when the last bit of actual data comes in, you can then like run those remaining steps, and we have a, as little overhead as possible. Um, 
So uh, that's like, this is sort of a proposed um, absent sigil, for example, that maybe you could have in a document. We're not really sure. We're sort of working on making sure the, the, the building blocks are there to do this, and we'll see kind of where it, where it leads us as far as the implementation of the sort of API is concerned. Um, there's another feature that often comes up is a term projection. Um, if you want to see a GraphQL implementation that is really, really, I think, ahead of the curve, the Scala uh, implementation has served as a great source of inspiration to us and major props to those guys. And so the, the feature idea here is when we talked about getting a list of events based on our filters, GraphQL will make sure that there's not extraneous data returned to the user, but it'd be cool if we could extend that all the way into, for example, our Ecto query. Like, what if we could just select only the fields from Postgres that are asked for from GraphQL? Or how do we deal with loading associations in an intelligent way? Um, right now, you're kind of on your own for some of that stuff. We don't have a lot of features there. And so oftentimes in, our, in practice, we tend to just load what we people tend to uh, like ask for, or we get a little bit of logic that can look at the, the, the query itself and try to figure out what needs loaded, but it's relatively complicated. And so what we'd like to do is kind of provide, not literally this interface, but these ideas where that second argument to the def events is just some information we provide to your function about the GraphQL context. And so we'd like to be able to have like an absent Ecto library that can build preloads, that can build, so that's supposed to be selections. And so when we are getting our events, we'll preload exactly the things that are asked for and nothing more, and exactly, uh, select exactly the things that are asked for and nothing more. Um, and you may be wondering, for example, how do we, um, how can you prevent people from like kind of attacking your database or your, your service by asking for the moon and a half, basically. And this is another thing that our, our, um, our new execution model is gonna enable is uh, query complexity analysis, where given a query, you can actually have a, an algorithm that goes through and weights each query by how much work you think it's gonna take, and then you can have a maximum limit on how much work a given thing can ask for and all this stuff. This is the kind of thing that we're hoping will be possible with, with our new approach. So, the future. Um, if there's one thing that has really like uh, uh, stood out with Phoenix is that it's given us some really incredible uh, real-time capabilities. And right now, you can totally, whether it's uh, subscriptions are kind of one mechanism GraphQL gives you or this live data thing we were talking about earlier, um, you could send these things over a channel and have some like callbacks in your channel that call absinthe run or whatever. But um, we'd like to make that more first class. We'd like to make that a, a, cleaner, um, a cleaner integration. Beyond that though, the real time extends beyond the web and extends beyond Phoenix. And GraphQL is, is actually extends beyond the web itself as well. There's, um, you know, we're using data that come, when data comes in, we want it published to certain worker processes that maintain state about objects in the real world, or maybe you're having it update local UIs or something. The, we're trying to, we want to use GenStage, which you're probably going to hear a little bit more about um, from jo Jose's talk tomorrow, which it gives us a really generic API for streaming data in Elixir. We want to target that as um, kind of our primary API so that you can use this whether you're using Phoenix channels or you just want to have it streamed to some dedicated set of processes. Um, streaming to and from that is, is I think, what we're going to target. We're not there yet. There's a lot of this that um, we don't have yet, but the, and I'm not entirely sure how we're going to achieve some of this, but when I look at uh, the tools that GraphQL and Elixir has given us, and I look at how from those tools we have um, this really ridiculous set of features that have come out of that, I am completely convinced that uh, this kind of future is, is definitely within our reach. So that's all I got. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up. I'll be, there's some time now, I'm quite sure, I hope. And uh, I'll be around, and so thank you. We'll certainly have time for some questions. Anyone? Uh, great talk, thanks. Um, uh, so, is it possible to to restrict your queries uh, on time series data as well? So in other words, I want 
let's say I want today's data, I want all of it, I want to defer the last week, and then I want to really defer the last three months on some time. Yeah, time. sure. Um, so I will, um, I, will, I will sketch up what that would look like briefly here, uh, if I can make this font size larger. Um, so basically, uh, is, that, is that sufficiently readable to everyone? Okay. So things, there's about a zillion things I did not talk about because uh, there's a lot going on. So one thing you can do with GraphQL queries is um, suppose the name of the feed, you want to do several, um, in this case, uh, we'll just call it data for some, for like start at, we're going to start at um, uh, a time, you know, one dot week dot ago. We're in Ruby now. Um, no, and so now you want to do this, um, and we'll just call, we'll just say we're going to get the value. Suppose you want to do like a couple of these in one thing. You can provide an alias on a field. So this is like last week, and then uh, this part is uh, last month maybe or something. And so I'm not going to fill all this stuff out, but you would see how you'd have a start at and an end at that was like a different point in time. You could have several of these, and then you would, be, and so when you get the response back, it will have the last week as like the, the JSON key and the next week as a JSON key and stuff. And you could have uh, different, I've lost my cursor, but that's okay. You'd have different defer on here. Um, directives take arguments. So you could have like defer level or something. I don't know, this, this API is still sort of developing, but you could sort of uh, have a priority there. Does that answer your question? Cool. I just wanted to know if there were versioning considerations, like. Yes, so one thing uh, that uh, my coworker Bruce uh, told me about nine times to mention, and then I forgot to mention, was uh, that GraphQL is first class support for deprecation, so you can deprecate fields with a reason and so on. Uh, the pattern that it tends to follow is that um, you tend to deprecate stuff and then replace it with, with some other field. So there is not explicit versioning. Some people have tried to uh, kind of follow a pattern where everything is kind of namespaced under version, so nothing stops you from doing this, you know? Uh, and so people, people do this. Uh, in general, the pattern tends to be that you don't change what the existing types and values of fields are. Instead, you just make some new, new field and or deprecate the old one, and when people are getting the data back, they'll see the deprecation notice and it'll have some time span associated with it. Further questions? Yeah, um, oh. so in GraphQL, when you execute a query and you have different uh, fields you're getting, yes. you can do them in parallel according to the spec. Yes. Have you gotten around to doing that yet? Uh, no, um, in no small part because of the limitations around uh, our previous execution model. We could have tried just basically a, like, in a map task async. Um, Part of the reason we didn't want to do that is that um, we, with the beam and concurrency, you want to not shoot yourself in the foot because we're passing back relatively large data structures often. And so we wanted to try to look at that in more detail, maybe leverage some of the concurrency limits that GenStage gives us so that we can not, we can sort of have a good balance between do it, optimi benefits we get from concurrency and uh, a balance against the, the cost of copying data sometimes and, and so forth. That is a really good point though. One of the things I really like about GraphQL is it does have a, a, the question of concurrency addressed in the spec where if you're doing a query of just getting data, you have to implement it in a way that allows it to, that allows it to be uh, concurrent. So you know, don't be, don't be um, you know, updating some counter somewhere and you know, that's gonna screw up your concurrency. Mutations, on the other hand, where you're altering data are always run, run serially. And it's, I think, a good sign that the spec uh, kind of addresses those kinds of questions. See your hand going up? Please stand up until I can give you the mic. This is what happens when your, uh, your presentation timer resets. You don't know how long you took. Um, so I've worked in the past with the Graffiti Mongoose library. Have, are you aware with that? It's a Node library. I have written about ten lines of Node.js in my life. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it's kind of cool. So basically, it integrates uh, with the model layer, so it can automatically generate some of your queries for you. Oh, cool. Um, so you should definitely look at it. Um, but is there any plans to kind of like look at Ecto? schema definitions and be able to kind of auto-generate some of those things instead of doing the, the schemas twice? 
Yes. So um, one one important caveat there is that uh, GraphQL is supposed to be a data model for your API clients, which may have a lot to do with your underlying Ecto schema, and it may have nothing to do with your Ecto schema. Or in our case, it actually hits some in-memory processes sometimes. It it's so with that caveat there, you know, there's not always this one-to-one -one correspondence. Yes, we actually already have, or certainly had, and need to update uh, just a mixed task to say, hey, given an Ecto schema, I'd like to to generate um, a sort of analogous thing. We're probably going to do that in a sort of mixed task. It's kind of a helper tool. What we're going to avoid doing is like a big macro that's like, hey, this is based off this thing, because then you're generating a ton of code you can't see. It's hard to modify, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yes. Uh, more of a general GraphQL question. So the whole model works really well if you have a kind of a single uh, data storage underneath, like a single database, for instance. Uh, is there a story to run GraphQL against something that is highly distributed? Like when you basically your data lives in like ten different data stores somewhere, and you have to like put it together. So um, I used Ecto as an example because I, as Elixir developers, that's a relatively common kind of base of experience. But actually, GraphQL was designed for literally that. Facebook used it as a common, they wanted a common interface over the dozens of different kinds of data stores that they have underlying. And that's part of why at, at the application, when it comes to actually getting the data for a function, it's calling pure Elixir code. That can reach out to Ecto. It could reach out to in-memory processes. It could reach out to a bunch of different things. Crazier still, in, in a lot of cases, where Facebook has had situations where you have two services. They both expose a GraphQL API. They wanted a third service that would basically, you could ping that, and it would route to the correct thing. Because of introspection, that third service could introspect on both of those queries and generate the sort of union, uh, union um, 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 schema that would cover all those cases and then route data accordingly. So it's it's entirely possible. I I'm speaking in generic terms because I've not um, other than other than sometimes calling Ecto and sometimes calling uh, some in-memory modeling we do. I don't have a lot of personal experience doing that, but it is um, certainly the origin story, honestly, of of GraphQL. Well, okay then. Give Ben a big hand. Thank you, guys.